You heard it right here, right down from the beach. The new ivory is manifest. What do you guys want to know? I can, I've done way too much research on dinosaurs. <laughs> Almost a larger than life figure. Uh, no reason at all to think it was made by aliens. Drop down and go swimming as fast as you can. Out of All these big giants, you may kiss and tell them they don't. The crowd, just the pot, the loudest, the excite, the electricity. I don't know if I can take your little Canadian destroyer. The future is scary, but it's also wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unscriptified podcast where genuine meets uncensored. Of course, powered by Jägermeister. Today we have the privilege of sitting down with an acclaimed cinematographer whose work has left a lasting legacy in the film industry with a career spanning decades, whose lens has captured some of the most iconic moments in cinema. He is a visionary cinematographer who worked with the greatest and pushed the boundaries of visual storytelling. He is a true maestro of light and shadow. His portfolio includes Gladiator, Logan, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, Kingdom of Heaven, and the list goes on for more than 60 titles. Grab your popcorns as we are joined by none other than two-time Oscar-nominated cinematographer John Mattison. John, thanks for coming and are you ready to go, John, in Alison's and the ice cream? <laughs> Hello. Uh, well, it's always fun and interesting to hear the journey of great men such as you and to get to know uh, what made them, uh, what shaped them, what, what tried to conquer them. Can you share with us how you got yourself entangled into this uh, world of cinema and lenses? I, mean, I think everyone loves a movie and, um, you know, um, you know, the, the act of going to cinema, you know, get away from your mundane life. Mm-hmm. And you can, you can dream, or or you get a relief from your everyday mm-hmm. dirt, dirty laundry. You, know, you you get away from everything. So I was at a school. I was set to school age seven, and they had a cinema club on Saturdays for the boys who, you know, didn't get to go home. I didn't get at home because my father was away. And, well, my whole family was away. So they used to have a cinema every other weekend. And I mean, not that I hadn't been to cinema already, just that in the sort of horror of an English school that you um, could, uh, you know, escape for a few hours and watch a movie. So they used to show on 16 millimeter with a projector in the room, clattering away again, da, 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 and the terrible sound. And they'd, um, they'd show us boys a film. And then whatever that film was, we would, we would um, play that movie for the next two weeks till we got here. It was Robin Hood or some aeroplane film. We'd be flying aeroplanes or we'd be shooting arrows at each other. So that was that was the magic. But I didn't really know where films came from. Um, I just thought I don't know. I didn't I didn't know how they were made. They just they just were there. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I I think I probably wanted to be probably wants to be James Bond or something, but then, you know, as you get older, you start watching, you know, films that like, uh, that stay with you for days on end. And interesting, like the BBC, which was the BBC two, the small, the small of the British broadcasting government broadcast, mm-hmm. which shows, you know, French sixties, John Goode Goddard, or, you know, the American friend Wim Bender's films and you would you'd see these films in which nothing much happened, but three days later you were still thinking about them. But anyway, so I I finished school, which was, you know, anything like this was considered to be it wasn't even thought about at school. You had to be business, management, army, clergy. You didn't um you know, films as I said, films came from somewhere else. They don't know where they came from. Hollywood or some other people made them, Europeans made them. So there was no real uh, idea that you could be consider this as a career, um, and I didn't think of that. I also, but then I I just fell into it. Really, I bet, met a bunch of other people who had the same sort of fascination with cinema, and we used to get together and make. Um, and there was a film school involved that some of us went to, some of us didn't, which was really expensive and wasn't really a film course. It was just someone taking money off us, but it was a good way to meet people and um and you know i mean i mustn't be too cruel about it. it was a good place to go and they did teach you basics and you can get your hands on some 16 millimeter equipment some nagras you know 
that recorded quarter inch magnetic, magnetic tape, and you can make crap little films. And um, that became um, that became the sort of uh, an introduction to lots of other people, and um, we we could then. Uh, you know, we we dreamed about then one one of one. I remember one of my friends had a job as a runner on a film. It was amazing. It was on a real film with real people, and we couldn't believe that he um, he actually you know saw filming me made. Um, and then we got jobs as runners and stuff like that. You know, and working cutting rooms, which I think is very important for all filmmakers to do. Especially cinematographers and one also directors too. You know, knowing what's you know because you make lots of nice shots until someone cuts them together. They don't mean anything, and then you realise that a cut works. You know, just a simple choosing when one shot, not when the photographer thinks it should end, when the editor should think it ends, and making that cut, and then joining another piece of film to it, and knowing that that actually works or is smooth and has a language. And that, to me, was incredible. More, more incredible than sort of developing a picture or something to actually see a film put together through a bunch of, um, um, you know, shots that didn't really... They were just shots. You know, you just join them up, you did them. But when someone puts together... So to see when that lived. So that was good for me to be in cutting rooms and I was on edge numbering, which was an early time code system of burning... Um, you know, tip X white numbers onto magnetic stock and onto the film in the same place so that when you cut the film up, you had a reference across on the perfora- in between the perforations in that gap where the film wasn't to actually sync up and work out where a shot was. Because as you're making a film, the film gets cut and cut and cut and cut. So you had to know where those frames were. So we had to, so that was one of the things I had to do, which actually number, an edge number. Once the film's sunk up with a clapboard, you would edge number them, then send them back. Again, I wasn't really getting in cutting rooms. Anyway, I was running, and I did this. I did some scenic painting. I did this, that, and the other. And I wanted to get on camera. Eventually, became a sort of clapper loader. And then I did a lot of documentary stuff, news, ENG, mm-hmm. you know, riot strikes, got a few black eyes from policemen and from miners. Then they'd bash the camera in your face. It used to hit the view and go straight in your right. So, and the one from, uh, you know, yeah. And also, you know, then, then music videos came along. And you know we do, and then they got a lot more black eyes from punks who punched the camera, you know, as part of the films. And then uh-huh. you know that, yeah. And then you know, just did a lot of more that um, that punk, you know, uh, music videos and the punk rock movement in Britain were very much instrumental in me getting where I was. But it was it wasn't planned. It wasn't I'm going to do this. I didn't know how to get into it. As I said, I didn't know how. I didn't know where films came from. I didn't know how they were made. But then, you know, if you're going to be a cinematographer, you better start shooting really, really soon. Don't hang around on big movie sets with big directors and think that they're going to give you, well, you're going to learn too much. You're not going to learn anything from fancy directors or fancy DOPs. What you're going to learn is when you do it yourself. And so I shot, I'm not sure if it's 300 or 500, probably 300 music videos. So that's what I did for many years. You know, I did two a week. For like three a week sometime. And I traveled and there was a whole big music scene. And that, you know, there was a big unions at the time. Unions are really unfriendly to to um to uh, you know, young people trying to get in. They they weren't diverse, they weren't egalitarian, they were very sort of rather you know, they were nodding people. They were well, yeah. They were very right wing and red right wing newspapers, boring and and uh, made boring films, and uh, they didn't like us. <laughs> and uh, you know, I I got in, I you know, I got given a lot of gigs by black filmmakers, by gay filmmakers, because um, I was either too posh or did, I wasn't someone's nephew, wasn't someone's son, and. Um, Anyway, the unions, the unions didn't really touch music videos. We were left to our own devices. But then you get good at them. And then, you know, I was always shooting drama and drill tops at the time. But then you, you get noticed, you get commercials, you get commercials, you get more money, you can show off as a DP. You do fancy shots or lots of fancy lights. And then you get noticed. But then getting into drama was another deal. You couldn't really get into drama because 
if you did commercials, you were ridiculous. You couldn't make commercials. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, in England, there's a lot of sort of uh, um, weight in, 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 in literary, li- literature and writers and, you know, people that have studied English at Oxford. And, you know, I, I cannot be bothered with directors who've been and, and studied English. I was saying, it's got fuck all to do with filmmaking. And I always think, you know, <laughs> It, you know, if, if William and you know the, the, the British aren't that literate. You know, the Irish, Scots are, but the, the English are. But the Italians are, the French are. They have a visual language. Italians, in particular, they they can do things with the camera. They can they can make sense of shots. And, and now, Lee Hing, work. Can you guys turn it down? You're really fucking loud in my ears. You're really loud. Can you talk <laughs> about that? Um, or yeah. just push the mics by the way. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I mean, my, my, you know, coming in from, you know, more liberated and other less institutional people who hadn't had the classic education, like black people and gay, you know, guys who were more into throwing the camera around, not, not the best filmmakers by any means. I mean, Derek Jarman was a appalling filmmaker, I think, and he gets given far too much uh, credence, but. You know, he's gay and therefore everyone lords him, but he wasn't a very good filmmaker. But there were some really good other ones going on at the time, ex soldiers, Nicholas Rowe, you know, Greengrass, Ken Russell, really good guys, and also the whole French thing going on. So there was uh and I always think if Shakespeare came back to 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 Earth now and you said, you know, hey, Bill or William Shakespeare, you you, you can actually make the merchant of Venice in Venice. There's this thing called a camera. And you don't have to do all this stage and too much wordy, wordy stuff. He said, fuck me, this is good. I think his, his scripts will be a lot shorter. You can introduce someone by the way they look, the way they walk into the frame the first time, make an entrance in a very much Hollywood way. So I think that 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 all came through music videos. We didn't have that structured background. And everyone laughed at us. And those are the generation of filmmakers you see now, you know. You know, we've grown old, but grown boring, but they're the ones taking awards and stuff. Um, but I, I put a lot of, um, in retrospect, I put a lot of um, weight on, on what happened in those early years, what happened to me, um, that, you know, that we did things. We didn't know. We really didn't know. But we did it so many times. We got good at it. And, you know, you take all your crazy ideas and you realize that only 5% of them are any good, and then you perfect those. So that was the way in, I think, for me. It wasn't, um, I didn't go to school. I didn't study for film. I had a bunch of friends who educated me. You know, they took me to funny little cinemas that used to be lots all over London, and we'd watch films for, like, you know, two euros 50 or something, and, you know, you, you could... You could, you know, and they were warm. You know, if you, you know, they were warmer than my apartment. You could stay there and watch films all day, rather than pay for the eating bill and go home. Um, so, am I getting a bit dark? Should I switch the lights? <laughs> Can you see me again? Okay? Yeah. Should I switch lights on or not? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. Hey. Um, anyway, so that that was me getting into stuff. I, I, you know, as I said, it wasn't. I think, but you know, I meet a lot of you know grips and people and um others you know who uh everyone's got their own story you know no one's got like oh you know i you know the film film business is a way of choosing you you know it's almost like a sort of um a god comes down from the space and says you and um you know that's uh it's not um a recognized way in i don't think yeah, but you, you uh, the industry. Uh, yeah. You have something more to say? No, 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 not really. Uh, you are in the industry for decades, and you are witnessing how cinematography evolves, trends, yeah, has changed. And but probably, uh, and I was the, the making of, for example, Percy Jackson TV series, and it with the adba- advancement of uh, VFX or uh, CGI, all those. Uh, camera technologies uh, how do you see the role of cinematographer evolves because everything now is basically recorded this this in this augmented studio full of panels that uh, 
reflects and everything. I don't know technology. Do you find that it enhances or challenges the creative process? Um, well, I didn't know, you know, photography and cinema has got any better. Um, you know, I you know, wouldn't say that the late runner from when it was late year before last would have, was better than Ridley's one, you know, photographically, I'd say the first one had, especially given the time was more. You know, had more. I believed that world. I believed, you know, I think Ridley's very good about creating worlds of like the future's not going to be like 2000 months, it will be gritty and dirty and greasy and all the rich people upstairs, all the poor people downstairs, where there's no atmosphere and toxic. And so, I mean, I think that film photographically conveyed that. The new one, I didn't really know where I was. I felt like it didn't really, it had felt too clean to, um, exactly to, uh, I mean, beautiful, but I didn't believe it. Um, so, it can, you know, ha, ha, has, has, yeah, has photography moved forward because of digital? No. You know, are, are the pictures better? You know, is Roger Deakins better on digital than he is on film? I don't think he is. Um, um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I mourn that process of, of being a good film cameraman of understanding emotion, understanding the process, understanding how to print. And you're working very much in stone. You, you know, you had to, you cast the die and you were in, you know, you didn't, you, 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 you worked in, in real concrete things and you know, you didn't fiddle around with it later or soften it off or build windows or stabilize or even cut people out entirely and put them somewhere else. That, that wasn't. You know, you had to you had to know your stuff, and you had to also know your stuff photochemically. You had to understand chemicals. I mean, not too much, making it sound too uh, like black magic. But there's certainly you know, the old photographers with the big black velvet gun over your head and held, you know, watch the thing click. You know, there's a certain amount of magic in photography that um, that was always respected, even though there might have been a whole lot of bluffers behind it who were like full of shit. <laughs> talking stuff but 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 you did actually you were responsible for the negative that tiny little thing it was a little thing like that and there's no there's no problem uh projecting white it's actually trying to cr create good blacks so when you have something that small you're blowing up something the size of half a tennis court tennis court you've got to get that thing to to a really good place where you're exposing it beautifully, but you're making the blacks hard enough. You're suppressing the grain. You're understanding how to to balance that to get the best out of this analog image you can. Um, and that was an, that was Evan. You know, talk about it. it's a craft. It was a skill. Call it an art form, but actually just understanding the photochemical side or getting to know yourself. And you know you had light meters, but you had your eye. Your eye is and you trust it. Um, now you turn up in the set, and everything's you know, cameras see everywhere. There's too much latitude. There's green screens everywhere, which you know I can teach any idiot to light a green screen for <laughs> twenty minutes. No, really, I mean it's not it's not mysterious. I remember Seamus McGarvey and I had a had a girlfriend or friend girl whatever, and she told us, and she was a cinematographer. She told us she never shot green screen, and we both looked there with absolute, you know, um, unbelief. We couldn't believe she said that. Anyway, we both told her how to light green screen in in about five minutes, and she looked at us and said, "Is that it?" Well, yeah, you know, that's it. So you don't really. The higher you go in the food chain, the less you have to know. You know, I've said this before. You can. I could turn up drunk on a big shoot, and someone would look after exposure. The green screen would be lit. You know, when you're on the smaller films, you have to be more resourceful. If you're on a smaller film and shooting film, you better have your wits about you. You better be really on your game. And you better not get drunk the night before. And you better understand your eyes. You better understand what you see. You better doubt everything. You better doubt your light meter. You better look in through the frame and actually think, is this it? Is this where I want to balance this shot? Where's the key turn? Where's my highlight? Where's the bottom end? Am I stretching it too much? Actually, I don't want the audience to see over there. I want to make that black. You don't do any of those things on digital. 
None of them. There are no rules but one. Drink Jägermeister at minus 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, you, you mentioned now, uh, obviously, about uh, Dickens and uh, about uh, digital versus uh, film, uh, things that mm. you spoke about. Uh, and I actually listened to Quentin Tarantino, who I think still insists on uh, filming on, on, on film or recording on film. Mm. Mm. Do, do you feel, because I, I get the feeling sometimes, uh, you know, watching these movies that are heavily CGI, that they look almost too real, like, and therefore they look fake. Uh, do, do you get that uh, feeling for the audience, maybe that, you know, we are just making something that looks too perfect, so to speak? I don't know if I'd describe it as perfect. I think it's, um, I don't know, it's difficult to say what's baked into our minds or what we think an aesthetic is. Um, you know, why you think the colors or the resolution is more pleasant on film, even though that's grainy and it flickers. And, um, but I do find the colors more sophisticated on on film. You know, they, in digital, they tend to gravitate towards the primaries really quickly. So if you had a poppy red, like a red with oranges in it, it might go very much towards a guardsman red or the color of a British phone box or British a phone box or a post box or a British guardsman outside Buckingham Palace. It'll go super. So it's difficult to muck things up. Things look, cl things clean up. I just don't think digital cameras or electronic images, let's call it, they'll call it video because that's what it used to be fucking called. And they give it this fancy name. It's like Turbo. Remember Turbo came out? You could buy Turbo sunglasses. Very difficult to buy sunglasses with a petrol injection in them. To, you know, it was everywhere. <laughs> So, you know, but it's still an electronic camera. Electronic, I mean, I wasn't allowed to shoot on film when I started. I shot a lot of Stoney 3000s, Beta Cam SPs. You know, we shot on on on, on uh, tape. Uh, but still, the camera, the front end, still had the same problems they have now. Sony's about the Reds, Ikigami did this, Panasonic did that. So, whether it's that or whether you associate it with, I don't know cheap television, news crews, or whether you prefer the colors, which I do, because I think Kodak, by the end of it all, were very good at getting those dyes to stick on the celluloid to make an image that you found pleasing. Now, whether that was right or too real, as you called it, if you shoot it digitally, I don't know. But I do feel more comfortable, but I'm thrilled this year that most of the films, that, whether they're good or bad or whatever, that going for awards were shot on film. There seems to be this um, I don't know. I mean, you know, do you like coffee? Do you like tea? You know, nothing wrong with digital. I just don't like it. It doesn't do anything for me. It hasn't really made my films any better photographically. I hate it when it's outside. I hate it when it's cloudy. You can't do anything with it. Inside, yeah, you can light it. You can do this, you that. I just don't and also, I don't like everybody else joining in and telling you what to do. Um, monitors all over the set. You know, no one used to come out and sit in a laboratory out near the airport in London at 7 o'clock in the morning in great films and smelly laboratories with guys in brown lab coats smelling of ammonia and vinegar. And, you know, oh, you come to Soho and have a bit of... Uh, have a bit of lunch and sit around. Would you like an espresso? Or do you want the you know, Wi-Fi code? No one... You know, you go out there and, you know, it's all oh, come along at 11. The guys say, no, you'll be at 7 in the morning. Eyes open, looking at the film, and it would fly through that projector at speed. And you had to call the shots really fast. What was wrong with it? I mean, you had to be really concentrate. And, you know, to grade a film would take you about a week. Now to DI a film, I mean, I, I like to work pretty quick. Like, it's a piece of music I like to get through in about. I mean, you can leave me alone, I'll do it in a week. But, you know, you're going to give me 10 days for the director or, you know, just over a week. Some people spend six weeks, eight weeks in there. And at the end of it all, you look at it and go, is that, is that it? And is that what you were doing there all that time? You know, I think uh, the boldness of film, the boldness of exposure, which gave us cinematographers different identities, you could tell 
that you know someone was behind the lens when you've got a really good looking film. You know, there's no difference when I, if I shoot a big uh, Marvel film, there's no difference between me and Cameron and Magari and Ben Davis. It all looks the same. It's all been treated. It all goes to the thing. It's it's just not. Um, you know, and you say if you like that, fine. But I wouldn't say it's got better. I wouldn't say, and I think, as I said, I think the shame of the new cinematography is coming up. You won't find the ones that can really look because they'll get lost in the melee of all the others because there's so many things to help you. As I said, I could turn up drunk on a set and it would all happen around me. Yeah. You mean- I mean, that might sound really callous, but it's true. If I turned up drunk with a light meter on celluloid, the film would be lost. You you know, you, it, everything rested on you. Everything, you know. If you had a cold or if you weren't feeling right, you had a row with your girlfriend or something, it all came out in the rushes mm-hmm. or the dailies, as people call them. So, so that, that I, oh, it's got brighter. Um, that I, I miss, um, I miss that process. My daughter, weirdly, I was helping her today. I was being an electrician, a spark. Uh, I mean, those lights are heavy, man. I forgot how heavy they were. Um, I burnt my fingers. You are the cinematographer here. Yeah, I know, but I was helping her. But she, anyway, she likes to shoot with constant light. And so I got some, stole some lights from Paddle Up. Thank you very much, Paddle Up. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I lit them for her. But she shoots on film. She used to say when she said, oh, is that one of the films with the funny colors? When she was about five or six years old. I mean, not that she, I don't think she could be a oh, But she could tell when colors weren't right. I mean, kids are fantastic. They're always painting and using all sorts of colors. But she didn't like some of the animation. She didn't like some of the, the films that were badly DI'd or were shot on digitally. She just, and then she went towards film. I mean, I bought her this camera, a very nice camera, you know, panel next Lumix thing. And she told me there's something wrong with it. I looked at it, I couldn't find anything wrong with it. She said, oh, it's just, it's wrong. And she said, what's that? I said, well, that on the shelf, that's, a, that's an old nickel. Oh, well, give me, oh, well, there's things you should know about this you know, she shot it. It's, it's orange. You know, that's an eight. And then you have to paint for it. You have to get it printed. It's, it's expensive. That's what you do. Just plug it into the computer. And so our photography got a lot better, a lot quicker than it would have done if you just carried on. Um, but that was her decision. It wasn't, I did not push her that way. But she has an eye, an aesthetic, and a, and, a, and a feeling for things that are to do with. The, I mean, I just think it feels more sophisticated, ultimately. I just think it's got better colors, better. I mean, resolution is certainly the other. I mean, I just did this big ABBA thing that you hear about, that big thing. And, you know, we tested the cameras at ILM and we chose the red, which is the best camera in the world because it had amazing resolution. Resolution has never really interested me that much. It's more the feeling of, of course, you've got to get it sharp and good and you want to enjoy the cinema experience. But it's the colors that I've always liked or drawn me to painting, to interiors, to different cultures, the way they, you know, the dying of a, of a, um, an East African shawl will be different to the way it is in deep South Africa or into West Africa. So what, what, why is there this color, this red is not the same as that red. This, so that, it, I mean, I, I do feel that film captures that better. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've got these lights now that, very clever lights that you know they make in uh, various countries, uh, particularly Sputnik and Estonia. And they say, "Well, we're only going to we're only going to make exposure for the wavelengths the camera sees," and that kind of makes sense. Why put energy and power into something? But you think, "Well, what's missing?" And if you look at a color arc of a film or a bit of Kodak film, it's like this. If you look at a you look at a uh, digital one. There's no red comes in, spikes up a blue, drops down. No cyan. Cyan's a big problem. Rises up again. Mm-hmm. Green and falls down. You have to synthesize the colors, pull them. Whereas a film bark is like that. And that's pretty much what your eye sees as well. So, you know, without going into the science of it all, um, as I said, ultimately, there's nothing wrong with digital at all. Mm -hmm. But do you like coffee? Do you like tea? And I think if I was a young cinematographer now, well, I wouldn't be. I'd, I'd open a bar or something wouldn't have the allure or the interest or that mystery that I had to learn and 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 get and it was good you know if you get good numbers from the laboratory 
they rang up and you know you were you know kodak had it or other well fuji fuji 2 had exposure levels of 25 across the, the band which was a bit too low allowed you to, so you you were looking for about 30 33 32 so if you'd hit 100 on your printing lights you actually felt good someone rang you up and gave you 27 yeah 31 yeah 32 and you go oh fantastic someone read you they'd read you three numbers on the telephone and you get excited you didn't have to see it <laughs> you were in morocco or somewhere in africa and they rang up and said that meant you'd hit the exposure exactly where you wanted it to be um yeah cool so, so that that's kind of um not gone but you know um, so I, that, that's one of the big differences, I think. When I started, you had to, uh, that, that's all there was. Um, there were no video films, as I call them, digital films. Yep. Um, well, you, you, you collaborated with various directors and actors. Can you maybe, uh, including Guy Ritchie or, uh, yeah. or Mangold, uh, of course, Ridley Scott and, uh, can you maybe share a particular uh, memorable or challenging collaboration? And, uh, uh, you know, I read that in some cases, some directors are on hands. They are, you know, maybe a little bit of control freaks uh, and some give a total freedom to uh, their cinematographer. Uh, is there cases like that for you as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's... Uh, the ones who really don't know or don't want to... They don't... Like I say, a lot of the English directors don't actually really know or they want you to take care of that. Doesn't mean they're not involved, but they don't know how to achieve it. And then the ones who think they know when they tell you what to do, and you go very politely, you say, yeah, yeah. And not to undermine them, you just do it the way you think, well, you know, I know what you're saying, but this is the better way to do it. And, you know, you usually might have a fight on the set, but in, in the end of the day, they go, oh, that's the best sequence we did. Oh, the best sequence we did, really? Okay. Um, and, so, and they're the ones who, who think they know, have a little knowledge, and that can be a dangerous thing. Um, but of course, you know, now with digital, you can't really argue. There it all is. You, know, you don't like it? Fine, we'll do something else. But, it, it you know, I don't, I don't get into it to... To, I think about it very deeply. I think about the script, the characters, how to make an entrance, the color arc of a film. What's the film do? Does it have a mood that goes up and down? You know, or to just you know do some cool shit to make it like some sort of fragrance <laughs> commercial all the way through. You know, I don't want to do that. You want you want to travel. So you know, I think about what what uh, what each character means to all. Not to give them a signature color, but. When something like musical, or something like Doctor Strange, you can, but you you you're trying to, you know, tell the story without. I mean, it was interesting when I used to make films. We go to the laboratory, and the guys in coats in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning, they would tell you if you made a good film or not because you know they're, they're just working the pictures, no sound. They never work the sound to the last possible minute, and they would tell you. And then sometimes two of them would argue and say it was. And they'd, they'd come to me like a referee and say, John, is, does when he goes to her, does she say this or does he say that because that's happened? And, no, I said, no, no, no. She knew that already. And the other guy would say, oh, I told you so. And they'd worked out the movie before <laughs> they'd heard me sound. So that was always a good sign if they'd worked out the film and thought the film was good. So, you know, those guys I'd listen to more about the, the, what they thought about it than some of the directors I worked Because they'd tell me if they made a good film or not. And invariably they were right. Um, because they saw a lot of films, and there was the one thing about going to a laboratory. You could actually get John Alcott's grader. You could get, you know, Janusz Kaminski's guy because you know, the, the lab guys didn't give a shit. You know, they, now you go to the West End or up in Hollywood, you get these rock and roll kind of <laughs> DI guys. You know, who come in with loud music and you know white sofas, lots of pretty people running around bringing you espressos with a twist of lemon, and you know all that sort of crap. Um, but they, they, these were working guys. You know, you go in and you get a shit cup of tea and a horrible white sandwich, a bit of undercooked bacon in it. But they really knew film. And the Hollywood too, one or two great graders in Hollywood, really good. They never got the recognition they should have done. Um, so yes, you had directors who were very vocal, ones who just said, "Look, make it look marvelous." 
uh, ones who thought they knew, um, and ones you can really you can really talk with. You know, you know, you look at uh, some of the films this year. You know, Robbie Ryan and uh, you know uh, Jorgen's uh, Poor Things. You know, a real collaboration. You can tell. You know, if a direct if a director if a DP is going to take a jump off a cliff. And the director said, I'll go with you. I'll hold your hand. Let's do this thing. That's when you see a great collaboration. You know, you can get films that look nice. You know, that's always a bad sign when someone comes out of cinema and says, oh, John, it looked nice. It's all very well making nice. You know, it means that no one, oh, it looked nice is a polite way of saying, you did your thing, but the film's a disaster. You want, you know, so that was a failure. I feel that's a failure on my part. You know, maybe because I didn't communicate enough, or maybe maybe I couldn't. But if you don't make a film that you're all pointing, pushing the same way, you can have fights, you do this, as long as you all go this way, and you haven't got people going this way, or just someone stopping, you're all pushing that way. Costume, hair, makeup, production design, very important, assistant director, all going that way, all going to take a jump off the cliff. That's a great thing, and I saw that a lot this year. And this this year's films, I thought some really bold films. Maestro is fantastic. Oh yeah, um, you know. So I've seen some really bold photography, design, and 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 good direction. You know, using their cinematographers and their design guys to trust and let them free and to do some big stuff. Um, so, uh, one. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the works that I love from you is Logan. Often praised. Yeah. Uh, also, Mangold is a great director, in my opinion. Fantastic. <laughs> but having mm. these elements of superhero genre with Western uh, and character driven drama, it has a distinct visual style. And even the noir version that later came, uh, different from typical superhero stuff. You worked on other stuff like Detective Pikachu and uh, Doctor Strange, mm. which look nice. Uh, but can you elaborate on the creative decision uh, uh, made to give this film a unique look uh, and atmosphere? It's had. Well, you, Logan. You mean Logan or? Yeah, I know Logan. Yeah. Logan. Yeah, well, Logan. I mean, Logan was sort of you know. I mean, I I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. You know, I didn't want to do it. Sit here at film. This producer friend of mine, he kept bringing me to come and I was like, oh, it's not for me. And he said, so he sent me the script. Read the script. All oh, right, I'll read the script. And he rang me back and said, um, what do you think? I said, oh, you know, it's not for me. He said, you haven't read it. I said, well, no, I didn't. There's an it. He said, read it. So I read it, and then they kill him. I said, we're going to kill a superhero? I said, are you going to kill one? I said, a long fucking last. Let's fucking get rid of them. Let's start with this guy who's killing <laughs> so, I said, so I said, I'm in. So I went over and met James. And said, oh, marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. Shot the movie. And... Um, of course, then I meet Hugh Jackman, and Hugh's really irritating. He's incredibly charming. He knows everyone's name. He never <laughs> curses. He never loses his shit. He's <laughs> really good at dancing. He's got nice legs, and all the girls love him. He's really irritating. So I thought, oh, we killed you know. So we did kill him, and that was great. But he didn't want wanted to make a film that was toxic. You know, the guy's dying. Didn't want to do beautiful desert scenes. You know, all rolling hills, sunset. You know, make it really hot and horrible. And he lives in a toxic place, and the desert's burnt out. I want to make it look like a 70s film like Easy Rider or yeah uh, you know just just sort of driving film two lane blacktop some really hard traveling um road movie I say he lives in an old wa- warehouse that it was you know they made some nasty thing in it. so Jackman you know that Logan is dying and you know they're all washed up these guys are played out they're finished so that was you know, it's a toxic film. It's a sad film, um, and you know, why they kill him? Well, um, it's great. <laughs> but I think it was. But then the, the monochrome thing was bullshit. Um, and you know, I'd worked very hard on going to those sage deserts and that burnt look and the yellows and stuff. And then, like it gave James Mangold a beautiful big medium format camera which was black and white and he was trying to work it and I was doing some makeup tests I said hey, give me that thing I pushed I pushed my camera out the way and I shot these um, portraits of um, uh, 
Patrick Stewart and, and Hugh, and they went on, you know, the IMD thing, B thing. It's just, you know, it's portrait. They're very nice. I mean, the camera's incredible because you, you haven't got three pixels. You've just got black and white, and it's an amazing camera. I mean, I was hoping to get a free one, but they didn't give me anything. James, but it was a beautiful <laughs> camera with it. incredible detail. This fine, fine because you, instead of having three pixels, you got one, you know, black or white. You know, just that's what it does. So the resolution's beyond, the depth is beyond, the velvetness. So I shot these features, and they that became this thing. And I don't know what happens. You know, these superhero geek people. They, they said it should be a black and white version, which I know had nothing to do with. I mean, it was just rubbish. I hated the fact they did that. You know, I worked really hard on getting those color separations on, you know, it's the sagey desert was said a yellow toxic thing and the sunsets that weren't too pretty. And then someone's, and you know, his, his flesh tones and those rusty interiors, you know, someone just, and so my producer, the one who got me into it said, come on, we're going to kill a superhero. You know, I was at a Q and a thing and it was all very fancy and full of, you know, Marvel morons, and someone said, um, You're insulting us currently. Yeah, well, I don't care. Um, <laughs> he, sa he said, uh, Yeah, this question came up about the black and white, and Joe just took the microphone off me and said, Do you go to your TV, find the chroma button, turn it left? Next question. You know, <laughs> it was just, it was just bullshit. I mean, the idea that you graded this, like, if you want to shoot black and white, shoot black and white. I will separate it. I will give you layers. I'll give you tonal separation. If I'm working on color separation, within those, the tones of those color separations, play secondary colors against primaries and those secondaries against second secondaries. Do not take my fucking work and stamp on it. But, yeah, understandable. Understandable. Yeah, but, I mean, it's uh, bullshit. It's bullshit. Everyone gets excited. It was all because I took three pictures on a very fancy Leica camera. But I was shooting black and white. I lit those for black and white. I didn't yeah, do it. I for remember your the first, the first picture from Logan, uh, promotional was black and white. Yeah, that's correct. That was, yeah, yeah. So there's the one. No, I think they, you know, the marketing and things they did very, they did things very clever, cleverly. You know, they were. Yeah, you know, if you want a really good portrait of someone, it, you know, it's it's a really interesting thing to do black and white. Especially if someone is of a certain age, they've seen a few things, they've got a lot of history in their face. Mm. And, you know, that's just, that was the character of Logan, and certainly the, 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 the character of, um, they, um, well, well Patrick I'll Stewart. You. Um, yeah, you know, that was, you know, he's been around, he's old, but everyone's old, they're all, you know, and, and they were, yeah, they're really great pictures, and, you know, and I, I remember talking to Pat, what you're doing, I'm sort of doing these really intense sort of black and white, like Duffy and David Bailey, and he knew exactly what I was talking about, a generation of British. Yeah, it reminded me. Patroclus. Yeah, and I said, oh, okay, okay. And he, he, said he did something, he kind of leaned into me and he looked at me through the top of his eyebrows. You know, he kind of, I don't know, did the 60s thing or something. But, you know, you, you do things differently if you're working in black and white. I mean, there's someone said to me the other day, they saw a version of, um, of um, uh, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, you know, Dougie Slocum, which he lit for Spielberg when he was something like 80 years old. And they said they saw a black and white version. They said, oh, really? And he said, no, no, it worked really well because um, that's where Slocum came from. He worked on layers of contrast and light and hard light and trying to separate dark things towards you and then, you know, keeping things brighter behind. And they said it worked quite well. I said, oh, you know, quite interesting. But if you were trying to make this a, um, a much more delicate film with delicate colors, and, you know, you know, let's say, uh, but, uh, you know, Romeo and Julia or something like that made by, you know, you know then, then that would be lost. You know, you, you need, color separation you need delicate tones even though they're not might be bright you need that so if you want to shoot black and white shoot black and white if you don't don't yeah you you were also involved in another super you know project uh bad girl and it's uh 90 million yeah. shelf in a box are you happy uh it won't see the light of day or is there something that we will miss uh, uh from it no I mean, it's, it's, it's tragic, tragic. I mean, 
Well, no, I mean, she, I mean, it was, it was actually for Leslie. I mean, she was great. Let's go. I mean, she's, you know, she's, she played it really kind of funny. I mean, it felt terrible for her, you know, the young actress, actor, actress, be addressed as, um, yeah. I feel awful for her because she worked really hard and she was like, you know, she's commissioned Gordon's daughter and her dad's a bit old and she's trying to look out for him and he's got a bit of history in his career. I've never did too well. And she's trying to defend him and, you know, and then these things turn up, this bad guy turns up some from his past and she's got this boyfriend who's a really nice guy, but and she likes him. They have a date night, but they're really boring. Then she's got this trans, 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 trans sexual person who really fancies her and she likes her a lot, but she doesn't really want her attention. Then she's got, she fancies the, the, the gangland boss's son, who's actually a bit like Michael, the first godfather. He's still a good guy. And she's in love with him, but the trans guy, the trans girl guy wants after him and the, the boyfriend doesn't know what's wrong. And the dad's wondering who this or, you know, redhead girl running around town is. And she's trying to fix everything. It was funny and she was totally endearing. And it was a really greasy film we made on the streets. There was no blue screen. The guys wanted to do models. They wanted to do models, real stuff, real thing. We had eaten in it. It was good. I mean, but then they got the, the, the film was, you know, needed some attention. You know, it wasn't the best. But, but it, what was good about it, it had, it had a real feel about it. It was really in the streets in Glasgow, which is a greasy, horrible, old, depressing town at winter <laughs> with snow and rain and I mean, it looked good, you know, Gotham's fucked and you know, they need heroes. It's just, everything was going downhill. And um, perfect background. No studio work, really. And um, then Warner's got taken over by Disney and then, I don't know what happens, you know, in that American thing, if someone comes in as CEO, they oh yeah, I'll just take that over, everyone keeps their job, they come and they fire everybody and they kill projects. And they got killed or got taken, it was told it wasn't suitable this side or the other. I mean, Warner's UK were furious, you know, they were, they weren't on this sort of, it's very much the American way of taking over a company and killing other things. Um, you know, it sort of happened with George Lucas and, and Paramount back in the day and George Lucas managed to nick the rights to Star Wars and didn't they regret that when they got taken over. And so, you know, the, the, you know, but there is this thing of just the ax comes down and that's what killed it. I mean, it, it, it needed some work and it was nearly them. And we were talking about, you know, picking up some shots, changing a little bit of the narrative here and there, but nothing much, you know. Um, I don't think it would have been the best, but it was it was a very different film, very different. It felt very real. It felt about this 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 girl who was totally endearing and lovely, and but just always screwing everything up, but trying to do the right thing by everybody else, you know. She's trying to save everyone. She wasn't like this big kind of muscular, you know, Captain America thing she was just this and then she had this secret life you know and then trying to look after her dad and look after my boyfriend and you know it was it was good and i don't know where but i mean they did kill it it is gone they picked up everything every storyboard every frame everything went into the incinerator um yeah i don't know i don't know i don't it's it's rather sad I mean, well, you know, even if it, you know, you just throw, you know, you build the house, you build, and then you just set fire to it, burn it down, you know, did it, did it, you know. <laughs> at least you have insurance. Yeah. Well, that was what it was part of. It's sort of a tax write off. They could do it as part of it. I mean, it's just obscene. I mean, that's, you know, you, know, you hear straight, straight, well, business, American business, and the way American business goes sometimes. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the way, I don't know. I don't know. Look at, look at, that fantastic businessman Donald Trump is <laughs> a destroyer of things, you know. And um, I think he's been very bad for America. I think some really bad decisions have permeated down from the top man. You know, if the man at the top is no good, then everybody else just runs around and really behaves very badly too. I mean, I just think it was a really, down on the street. Well, yeah. I mean, anyway, I don't know. I don't know what happened there, um, but it's sad. <laughs> well, well, that might just see it. We did some good stuff in it. You know, really good. Gothic y kind of modern. But I say it was real, you know. Mm, yeah. The guys who were on the show on film, they were very into like shooting models, very into old style effects. Mm. Yeah. I'm I'm burning to ask you about Gladiator 2, but uh, let's look at uh, your words. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, you are returning 
one of the most legendary films ever. And yeah. 24 years later, you're going to do the sequel. Uh, you know, first of all, how do you feel about first? Because I know you told us that you returned from the production and some reshoots are being spoken. How do you feel now about the Gladiator 2? And what is the, you know, difference, obviously, 24 years later? How much, how does the filming feel just of, of the sequel of that legendary film? Well, the film, I mean, you know, the sets are the same, exactly the same. We rebuilt it all. Obviously, now uh, there's a lot more action. Um, I think that's just the way films are expected to be. You know, maybe um, people want more, you know, the whole Marvel thing like, uh, from Born Nits. Okay. Um, for Born This to Born That, you know, it, you know, born identity, the other way people film things to be more, more they think they want more action. I don't know if they do. I think, you know, as we've had this year's Academy Award nominations, the BAFTA ones have really slowed that down a bit. And I, you know, hopefully we might be seeing the end of all these Marvel films where people just throw people through walls for half an hour and someone gets them up and lasers come out of their eyes and they're all dead. Um, but there is this pressure that's probably come Wait, on to all. that. Hmm? Well, there's this pressure that's come on to those sort of films to make maybe that influence Gladiator. Um, it's not quite as... I can't really tell you too much about it because we're still filming it, so I'm not yeah, yeah. how to speak about it. Um, so obviously it's digital, um, which is, that, as you just heard, not so great for me. Um, so ultimately, I don't think I will like it, or some people might not like it as much as the original. But then again, you're it's going to be very difficult to uh, hold up this against an original film because it was so, you know, okay. I mean, even when we made it, yeah, I mean, people didn't even know when we made it that it would be such a so well received film, and people loved that film. People seen it twenty times. That, you know, people just know every line in the movie. Um, I, you know, we when we made it, I didn't. We didn't. None of us knew that it was going to be. Well, especially me. Maybe it was just me. I didn't know that it was going to be this huge uh, success or this just go into like the you know into the very fabric of or what we think cinema is knitted into the history of it all. Um, they've been obviously talking about it for many years. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to spoiler though. I don't want to tell you anything really though. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's that's good for us for out. Mm. Uh uh John, obviously thank you for uh I know we are now short on time, so I want to thank you for being our guest. Yeah, yeah but, but but before sure. we wrap up, I have one more thing to tell you. Uh mm. you should change your uh, picture on nine D B uh profile. Trust me. <laughs> well I'll put that uh, should change why? Uh, I'm invisible. I don't do social media. I don't mind talking to you. I don't like talking to you. Google yourself. Uh, <laughs> Google yourself. Well, I got, I got other stuff question. to do. That's more interesting. Yeah, I'll send you a photo. <laughs> but, but more you know, you wouldn't mind it changing it because it's not representative. But you uh, on that picture. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, what you see in the thumbnail is two other uh, contenders for the Oscars. Oscars. Yeah. So, you know, it's not well, really did, did they Did they win? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, then that's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Better than you go. Yeah, well, back to look. Uh, it, well, before it, we wrap up, place. Uh, before we wrap up, we have uh, one more tradition, a little bit of tradition in this podcast where we say a quote in our language and uh, translate it to English. And uh, for this time, I chose a quote from our famous uh, director, uh, Živ Konikovic. And on our language, he said, Često se čudim kad vidim se koliko jede i žuči Ljudi prihvate film ili knjigu ili bilo koje umjetne, drugo umjetničko dijelo. Kako to doživljavaju kao nešto što je konačno i definitivno. Umjetnost je samo igra. Mnogo, uh, mnogo dalje od toga ne treba ići. And on English it will translate to I'm often surprised when I see with how much seriousness people accept movie or book or any other work of art. How they experience it as something that is final and definitive. Art is just a game. You don't need to go much further than that. 
fun of yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, don't talk horse shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <man. laughs> thank you for joining us and thank you for. Okay, guys. Take care. Nice to talk to you. We stay genuine, uncensored, and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Because all.